Oh, welcome everyone to a new episode of the Parallax podcast. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, Charles Dickens once wrote. This statement perfectly encapsulates the sentiment of the present times. In the Asian continent, new geopolitical paradigms seem to be emerging with a massive rise of China, the 10 ASEAN countries gaining sharp focus from around the world, the free and open Indo-Pacific vision gaining traction, multiple regional trading agreements coming into place. In this complex and dynamic regional setup, India has taken certain concrete steps to augment its engagement with the Southeast Asian region, like transforming its Look East policy into the Act East policy, the centrality that it has accorded to the free and open Indo-Pacific vision post the Shangri-La dialogue. However, given India's estranged relations with China and its recent disengagement from the regional comprehensive economic partnership, it is more critical than ever for India to establish a strong foothold in the Southeast Asian region. The focus of today's conversation will be India's current level of engagement with the ASEAN countries and charting out future challenges that it might face under a rising China. For this conversation, we have with us today a distinguished speaker, Professor Tanti Pachpai. He is currently a professor and the director of Center on Asia and Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. He's also recently authored a book titled India versus China, Why They Are Not Friends. Thank you so much, Professor Bashpai, for being here today with, for this conversation. I believe there's nobody better suited than you to talk about India-Southeast Asia relations, given your expertise. I'm extremely grateful to have you here. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. Uh, I've known IPCS for a long time. And of course, amongst the other things I am is uh, your professor. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, Professor, just to start this conversation and to set the context right, the first question I have is, um, how would you characterize or how comprehensive do you find the current le level of engagement between India and Southeast Asia, both traditional and non-traditional? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I think uh, the relationship is quite a wide ranging one and quite robust. Um, and I think a lot of people in India and also in Southeast Asia don't realize just how deep it is and how extensive. Um, so it, a lot of the kind of understanding we have of it uh, since the Look East policy and the Act East policy is that it's primarily economic. This is a big market. India's uh, trade with ASEAN is as big as it is with China actually. And, and a lot of people don't realize that either. But having said that, there's more to it than just the economic relationship. That was one of the original motivations back in the nineties when Narasimha Rao opened up the Look East policy, but it's also quite a deep strategic military defense relationship. And I think that part is less well understood and appreciated. Uh, and I must say that's true among Southeast Asian countries as well. Um, uh, and I won't describe all of it, but there are many bilateral and minilateral uh, agreements between India and the various Southeast Asian countries, not the least of which is Singapore, of course. But there's just a whole plethora of these. And, you know, they range from everything uh, like just training, um, let's say, um, airmen or na naval cadets and, and, and Navy personnel in Vietnam or, or Malaysia um, on aircraft or, or submarines um, to, you know, much more deep engagement as with uh, Singapore. And so I think, you know, and, and then you mentioned the word non-traditional security. So of course, India has all kinds of understandings, some naval exercises and, and so on related to HADR, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Um, so that if there was uh, unfortunately something uh, disastrous to happen in, in this region, you know, India would have a degree of interoperability with the armed forces and the governments in this region. So yeah, I think the, uh, as you say quite rightly, the relationship is actually quite broad based, but perhaps it's not as well publicized and understood by both Indians as well as Southeast Asians. Uh, Professor Bahri, since you mentioned about the Look East and the Act East policy, um, the present Indian government under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi was perceived to be extremely proactive in establishing like bilateral ties with the Southeast Asian countries. How successful do you think that engagement has been? And to that end, how has the Act East policy of India fared? I think uh, Mr. Modi began with a focus that wasn't really very ASEAN focused. Or, um, and um, I think the reason for that was that in the first year, particularly, maybe a bit longer in his first term, 
he was more interested in, he and his advisors were more interested in really hard strategic engagement with this region. And so the countries that the Modi government really reached out to in the first year, year and a half, were Vietnam, Australia, and of course the United States. I count the United States not as a Southeast Asian country, but as an important actor in the region. Um, and so if you look at the first visits that Mr. Modi made abroad, that's where he went, or that's where he sent his ministers, and those are the prime ministers and leaders that he received. Um, but I think thereafter, slowly, uh, he began to open up to the rest of the region. Um, I should go back for a minute. Why Australia, you know, Japan, Vietnam, and, and so on? Because these are the leading military powers in the region. Um, I mean, the rest of ASEAN, they don't have such big militaries, with one or two exceptions. And so I think that was the reason for that first year, year and a half. Um, but later, I mean, I think uh, the government did begin to open up to the rest of uh, ASEAN, and ASEAN is a collective. So he went to Myanmar uh, for an ASEAN meeting. He came to Singapore on the sad occasion of Lee Kuan Yew's passing. Um, you know, um, he, of course, came to uh, much later in 2018, uh, and address the Shangri-La dialogue that the Singapore government uh, uh, helps to host. Um, he went to other countries in the region, such as Indonesia, Myanmar, and so on. So, I mean, gradually, I think, you know, uh, uh, under Mr. Modi, um, the relationships began to deepen beyond those military powers. But I wouldn't say it was an extraordinary level of engagement. Um, it's more or less in line with earlier uh, periods. Um, in the 2000s under Manmohan Singh or even Vajpayee. Um, so there was a bit of a change initially to the militarily most significant countries, and then increasingly, you know, uh, to a more traditional base of ASEAN countries. Um, also, I was reading an interview that you gave to the Gateway House in 2014. So answering a question about what the new government should focus on uh, in regard with East Asia, one of the key areas that you highlighted was people-to-people -people engagement. So do you think seven years down the line that the uh, government has been successful in establishing that people-to-people -people network? And has the at least policy in any way contributed towards that end? Yeah, I think that one of the areas that has lagged actually is exactly that. Um, and I think it's uh, this fault on both sides. Um, uh, on the Indian side, I think one thing that we have done to try and encourage it is you know, um, make tourism easier. So visas, I think, have become easier for Southeast Asians wanting to come to India. I think we've improved hospitality in, in India, hotels and, and so on. Um, I think also that uh, Mr. Modi's emphasis on, you know, on Buddhism as a link to Southeast Asia um, and also visiting some Hindu temples in Southeast Asia and so on. Um, you know, that's probably uh, had some impact on uh, Southeast Asian tourism to uh, pilgrimage areas and an interest in India. Um, and I think, you know, to some extent, there's the usual kind of outreach on things like, um, you know, kind of academics or sporting ties and things like that. But nothing very extraordinary there, just very routine. Um, on the Southeast Asian side, I think India doesn't feature very high in terms of a, a place to go uh, for tourism purposes. I mean, here in Singapore, I wouldn't say an enormous number of Singaporeans would uh, tick off India as high on their list. And that's primarily because Indian facilities are not really of the, of the first rank um, in terms of hospitality and, and travel and infrastructure and even health and sanitation. There's a worry that you go to India, you could, and even law and order, to be honest. Um, so, um, and I must say, I think, you know, we have to look these things cold in the eye I mean, I think there's some people who uh, go and bring back uh, bad stories about experiences in India. I mean, there is racism towards people who uh, look Southeast Asian or Chinese. And, you know, when those are stories filter back uh, into the region, then that's a negative, I think. Um, I mean, of course, quite a lot of Indians come to Southeast Asia. Um, and again, Southeast Asians have started to open up more to Indian tourists. Uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, of course you know, uh, so that it's easier for Indians without visas to come to places. Um, I think there's been an improvement, but I wouldn't say there's been anything very dramatic. And on the negative side, as I said, you know, there is India's facilities. Um, and certainly in the last two or three years, 
the drop off of the Indian economy, uh, then the handling of COVID, especially after the first initial bit, which was okay. Um, the second wave, I think, has created quite a bad image for India in the region. And of course, who would go now to India uh, right now? So over the last year and a half, that has fallen off. So yeah, I think not a great picture on people-to-people -people ties. Uh, Professor Ashby, on that note, because we are talking about the present government and the step that it has taken, um, I think it would be a remiss to not mention the Indo-Pacific vision because it has become such an important part of India's eastward focus. And uh, also its subsequent membership to the Quad Alliance. Do you think that these two factors have any sort of ramifications for India's interaction with Southeast Asia? Well, initially, I think India's kind of signing up for the Indo-Pacific and the Quad was a negative in the region because the region was rather allergic to the idea of the uh, US-Japanese initiatives. Um, seeing them as taking away from ASEAN centrality, which is very, very important to the Southeast Asian countries, and which is almost a fetish in the region. Um, and so I think initially, India's kind of membership in those two um, uh, institutions, if you like to, to call it that, uh, was a kind of a negative, to be honest. Um, since then, I think the region has come round, led mostly by Indonesia. I think the Indonesians um, had their own Indo-Pacific idea and they gradually began to work with partners in Southeast Asia to sell the idea, partly because it fitted into their new maritime strategy um, and partly because I think they realized that uh, regardless of Southeast Asian feelings, uh, when Japan and the United States and then later Australia and the Australians had their Indo-Pacific idea, when these three or four big countries begin to talk about the Indo-Pacific so publicly and so positively, you know, it would be difficult for Southeast Asia to ignore it given their ties to these countries, particularly the United States. So I think Indonesia gradually brought the region around and now, of course, as you know, ASEAN has its kind of Indo-Pacific sort of a viewpoint, uh, but it underlines within that, that ASEAN centrality still should drive the kind of Indo-Pacific idea. The Quad, I think, still makes, I mean, if the Quad is the kind of military arm, as it were, of the Indo-Pacific, then to that extent, that worries, I think, ASEAN countries. So I think they're still much more ambivalent about the Quad. And to the extent that India is getting more and more involved in the Quad, um, then I think that's, you know, that there's a, a degree of uneasiness. I, I think to be fair to New Delhi, uh, the problem is that Southeast Asians want it both ways. They want India and other countries to be involved and to be a kind of balancing factor against China and sometimes within the region against their neighbors in Southeast Asia, although they'll never say that very publicly. Um, but then on the other hand, they don't want India, Japan, Australia, and the United States to be overbearing and too involved because it may alienate China and cause more problems for these these uh, Southeast Asian countries. So I think it's a delicate act, you know? Um, and now I think they've got used to the idea that India to some extent is going to be part of the Indo-Pacific. It's going to be part of the Quad and the events of last year, I think have made India a bit more enthusiastic about both those institutions. And I think there's kind of an understanding in Southeast Asia that it is what it is now. Professor Bashri, you mentioned something interesting that the Southeast Asians do look at India as a balancing force. Given the asymmetry between India and China, and also the fact that you mentioned that there is a dip in the economy also in India, uh, in the Indian government, um, do you think that it's still the case that India is still seen as a strong balancing force against China? Well, certainly the last couple of years have not been good in that respect. Uh, I mean, the, the dipping form of the Indian economy predates COVID. Uh, COVID has not helped, of course. Um, and I think the recovery is still not really on, although uh, commentators are saying there are green shoots to the Indian economy. But if we were hit uh, by another big wave of COVID, if vaccinations don't pick up, you know, I mean, the growth rates might be quite modest. Um, and by that, I mean less than 7%. Um, and so I think there is an understanding of that here in the region that India hasn't performed very well economically. And to that extent, it compromises its ability to, to uh, be a balancing factor. At the same time, I think 
you know, the region has seen India stand up to China in, in Ladakh militarily. And they are still betting that as we move out of the pandemic, uh, India included, that growth will return. And so, you know, India will come back. Uh, it's lost ground, but it will come back. So I think there's kind of a hope and a bet that, you know, an, a, a country with 1.3, 1.4 billion people will recover. And it just simply must be, given its bulk, uh, some sort of a balancing factor. And it has its own reasons for having a presence in this region, sailing its Navy here, continuing an economic relationship, uh, I mean, despite pulling out of RCEP, um, and, uh, you know, having a, a, a kind of a strategic presence in all the institutions as well, uh, East Asia Summit, ASEAN Plus Pluses, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the, the, the viewpoint here is a bit of disappointment, a bit of worry about India as a balancing factor, but still a, a hope and an expectation that India will come back uh, gradually, maybe a couple of years down the road. Uh, since we started talking about China, um, in a recent piece that you wrote for the Indian Express, uh, you mentioned uh, something that China evokes awe, whereas India evokes silence, because India is often left out of conversations of international politics and geopolitical affairs. On that very note, I just want to understand what, according to you, is Beijing's comparative advantage over New Delhi in its interaction with Southeast Asia? And do you think that that interaction has a bearing on India's engagement with Southeast Asia? Yeah, so I, I think that, uh, you know, this is a kind of an important point and we really have to, in India, think about it very seriously. I think there was a degree of complacency after Look East and Act East, um, uh, complacency that India was doing very well, that it was a genuine kind of uh, balance. Uh, it had a growing presence. The region was looking to India as well um, uh, in the context of their relationship with China. I think the last couple of years have certainly caused that to fall off, like I said. Um, and I think that, you know, um, so what are China's kind of equities or strengths here? I mean, first of all, there's simply the fact that China is such an important economic partner. I mean, it's the biggest trading partner of all these countries. Uh, well, everyone in the world, basically. Uh, so, uh, but very much in ASEAN uh, and Southeast Asia. It now has a huge presence in terms of outflows of investment. And so earlier it received investment from countries like Singapore and so on, but now it's sending investment out to these countries, including of course the Belt and Road Initiative. So, you know, they eagerly look to Chinese investments and I don't think India can anywhere compare in the connectivity game or in Indian investments in this region. So that's a, a second point. The third increasingly is Chinese high tech. Uh, in the app space, in hardware, in other elements of software. Um, China will be setting standards in the cyberspace area, like it or not. Uh, and these countries are going to have to think very carefully about where they go with 5G, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, China, after all, is on the, on the doorstep. And it has an ability to undercut other providers, Westerners. India is not even in the 5G game. So, I mean, really... Uh, we're nowhere. And these countries are ramping up for all of that. Um, I think if we move on from these kind of more economic areas, there's the sheer weight of Chinese military power, which causes fear and alarm. India doesn't, fortunately. But it just means that everything Southeast Asians do and think, most of the countries here, have to constantly keep uh, China in mind. What China wants, what China doesn't like, uh, and China is making demands on these countries increasingly. It's not shy of doing so. So there's no way of escaping, you know, the China factor. And uh, as I said, you know, China is always in the conversation for its economic strength, for its military capabilities and potential threat. And then, you know, the third is that China has enormous amounts of soft power. I mean, I think we think in India that as this kind of open society, democratic with the English language and all of that, we're kind of attractive to these countries. But the, the fact is, you know, that most of these countries are not open societies. Uh, they're in varying forms of being, you know, military regimes or, or communist countries or, or uh, otherwise kind of limited in the amount of democracy that they have. And for them, China might be the exemplar. Uh, here is a very powerful political party that has enormous control over its population and all 
you know, it, it's various levers, economic and otherwise, cultural. Um, and they kind of look up to that. Um, they would be embarrassed in the face of criticism over their democracies and China doesn't make those demands on them about human rights and, and so on. So I think, you know, they kind of look to China, that's Chinese soft power. Um, and I mean, I think we in India and the West, we don't appreciate the extent to which many governments and societies here are comfortable with the way China organizes itself um, and achieves all kinds of stupendous things. So, you know, there's an alternative model for them. And finally, of course, we also have to recognize that historically, there are patterns of migration into these countries uh, by which there are, you know, significant Chinese diasporic populations. They have intermarried into the elites. Uh, they have uh, sometimes not intermarried, but then they're important in local business um, uh, settings. Um, they are very dynamic. Um, and um, a country, I mean, compared to the Indian populations that have, have come uh, historically, who came from much humbler backgrounds and or, and didn't necessarily go into businesses. They worked with colonial countries to be lawyers and doctors and civil servants, you see, um, and may not have intermarried as much as well. So, you know, um, I think there's that lever as well that China has. And increasingly, China's not afraid to work with its diaspora for its own interests and ends. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. Um... Since uh, Professor Bashir, you've already mentioned a few challenges that are coming in the way of this interaction. What is the one major roadblock according to you? What is the one thing that is stopping them? Because um, I don't think it's solely China and solely China's interaction. And is it also just traditionally like in economic and military terms, is, it, is that the biggest roadblock that is blocking this impeachment? You mean on the part of India? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, there are several things on the Indian side that uh, get in the way. Uh, apart from all the things we've already said. Um, and one of those is that, you know, I mean, there's a legacy of the Cold War. Um, India in the 50s up to the Bandung Conference of 1955, and a bit after, still had a kind of, you know, uh, engagement with these countries, and it was seen as a bit of a leader. But after that, I think, you know, um, India kind of went off the boil. It had a, a moment when it was close to Japan as well, but Japan, looking at India's economy, moved away from India. And Japan became a very important economic factor in Southeast Asia. So as it moved away from India, I think that relationship to Southeast Asia didn't bloom. Anyway, India's economic model uh, was one that was not encouraged by the West in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian countries didn't take to it. India's democracy was not, again, not attractive to these countries. We have to remember that at least till the end of the Cold War and somewhat beyond, these were monarchies, communist regimes, and dictatorships. And India's democracy, which we as Indians may value, was seen as chaotic, noisy, disorganized, not providing you know, fast rates of economic growth, whereas Southeast Asia, much of it was going much faster than India. Mm -hmm. India's you know, uh, internal market and its preoccupation with import substitution meant that its economic culture was not consistent with the export-led uh, kind of e economic culture that these countries opted for. So there was that divide. Then in the Cold War, India was increasingly on the side of the Soviets or was very non-aligned. Um, and sometimes it allied with Vietnam. Uh, and then, you know, you had the Americans, the Chinese and the Southeast Asians uh, on the other side of the fence. So for a long time, India was out of that. And I think out of that, you know, all of that, there's still doubts and worries and, and ignorance about India. Um, and so I think that's, a, we haven't managed in our diplomacy to quite get over that, you know? Um, yeah. And I think the other is that there are sort of cultural elements here. I mean, there are elements in Southeast Asia who look down on India, you know, um, and um, uh, feel that, uh, you know, uh, uh, they've forgotten the kind of, uh, or don't know the historical Indian contributions or Indic contributions to Southeast Asia. Uh, and they, they look at modern India and they're not impressed, you know? And so I think that's something that Indian diplomacy and, and you know, and things like business associations and so on 
to some extent, that was corrected through the years of, of good economic growth. I think the last two, three years again has seen a sort of a rise of a view that, gosh, India just, it just doesn't stay with, you know, kind of linear path of, of economic progress. And um, so I think these are, it, it's complex. I mean, there are racist ideas here as well in Southeast Asia. You know, Indians were coolies, quote unquote, uh, when uh, the ones who came, I mean, that's incorrect, but, you know, uh, some did come from very humble backgrounds. And so, you know, there's, there's that kind of view of Indians as well. And, um, you know, it, it will take, uh, I, I was saying recently to some Indian friends, diplomatic friends and so on, after the last two or three years, India needs some big successes to showcase in Southeast Asia. I mean, the unfortunate pullout of uh, Singapore from, you know, the new capital in uh, Telangana, which the government there terminated the cooperation with Singapore, India pulling out of the RCEP, India's handling of COVID, India's economic, uh, a very mixed story over the last two, three years, if not longer. Um, you know, I, I think when Modi came and gave that Shangri-La speech, you know, when he said, oh, the free and open Indo-Pacific, I mean, it's inclusive, it's not, it's not a front against China. I think it certainly raised some eyebrows, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of seemed to suggest that India was not really willing to stand up to the Chinese uh, in the region. Um, and so I think there's just been a, a, a series of setbacks to India in this region. And I think Indian diplomacy desperately needs uh, some success somewhere, restore economic growth, uh, look at the vaccines. We promised Southeast Asian countries vaccines uh, and they haven't arrived, but we could still recoup that because these vaccine, this vaccine story is going to go on for a long time. Uh, we have to come back on vaccines. Our connectivity in Myanmar and, and in Thailand, it's been two decades or, or more of trying to build roads and other connectivity. We still haven't finished the projects and the Chinese just finished them in months or in a couple of years. So I think we desperately need some successes here. Um, Professor Bashir, since you mentioned about the vaccine, because that was also a question in my mind, um, because China has had an overwhelming presence in Southeast Asia as re in regards to the vaccine diplomacy and the COVID-19 relief fund that China has undertaken. And India, as you said, has not been that impressive and has not been able to deliver on its promises. In, to that end, do you think that is going to have a uh, lasting impact on India-Southeast Asia relations? that's going to stay if India is not able to re recover and deliver what it has promised? Well, it's, it's not a good story. Yeah, I mean, and it won't be a good story until, as I say, we have get some successes. And one of the areas where we could craft a success uh, in the coming months or in the next year or so would be vaccines. Once we ramp up and manage to get enough vaccines to our own people back in India. I mean, I think everyone understands that, you know, Obviously you have your own citizens come first and all of that, but uh, I think there was quite a lot of disappointment that India couldn't deliver on, on vaccines. And frankly, at the speed at which India is going at, at the moment in producing the vaccines and then inoculating people are rather slow. So, um, but I still see a possibility there for India to make a comeback. Um, and um, on the economic side, you know, there's a possibility too. We can, with the opening up of the economy, come back as a good destination for Southeast Asian goods, for Southeast Asian investments. Um, perhaps at some point, Mr. Modi can turn around and, and you know, come back to the RCP in some shape or form. You know, I think Australia, Singapore, Indonesia were quite keen to have India uh, be in uh, RCP and they uh, tried to hold off on a final decision on RCP as long as they could to accommodate India. And uh, we pulled out. And I think we pulled out primarily because of Indian domestic lobby lobbies who were worried about the Chinese factor. But I think that was a very big strategic mistake. Um, and, you know, the alternative we hear sometimes is, OK, well, India will do bilateral deals with countries. Mm -hmm. or, but, you know, you come back to what Jadish Bhagwati, the famous eco trade economist, said a very long time ago, which is you'll get a spaghetti bowl. You'll get so many different trade agreements. I mean, which business associations, which businesses, indeed, which governments will be able to keep track of all these different agreements? It'll be a mess. So, uh, you know, I think 
India's got to really wonder about some sort of trade next stage trade agreement with this region. If it doesn't want to come back to RCEP, can it up its game with ASEAN? Um, on, on my very last question, uh, because you've already highlighted the few areas that India needs to work on, uh, the withdrawing from our step, the vaccines, the economic. Uh, going forward, how do you envision the relations? Like, do you see it getting stronger? Do you see it getting uh, more integrated with Southeast Asia? Or do you see it being going to slow down for some time, given the COVID-19 and the vaccines? Yeah, I think the latter. I mean, uh, this is, uh, I, I don't see where, you know, the strengthening will come from at the moment. And much of it, it, de it depends on decisions uh, made in India. Um, the region is obviously is very open. I mean, one of the uh, uh, interesting things about Southeast Asia relative to South Asia is that, and especially India's view of, of, of the region, is that Southeast Asians welcome big powers from outside. They want them all in so that they balance each other off and create a space where Southeast Asia can flourish and, and be secure. We in India have seen our region, South Asia, for a long time as you know, our backyard uh, and we wanna keep everyone out. So, you know, I think Southeast Asia is very receptive to having India be a player in the region. But so, you know, if we want to take advantage of that, we've got to get our act together uh, and find a way back into this region uh, to be a major player. At the moment, it's, it's going to be very tough. I think next couple of years, I don't see India making a great impact. And indeed, some of the signs of Indian diplomacy are that we're looking elsewhere. Uh, uh, Jay Shankar, the foreign minister, is talking about, you know, uh, opening up to trade agreements with the United States, with Britain and with uh, continental Europe. Uh, he's not looking this side uh, because of his fear of getting entangled with China, I think. So, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's a strategic choice um, that uh, Delhi seems to have made, but it's not a choice that will then uh, kind of fuel and refurbish connections to uh, the ASEAN countries. Um, on that note, Professor Bashri, I think we'll wrap up this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for uh, elucidating such critical aspects of the India-Southeast Asia relations. And thank you so much for being here. Very welcome. And I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you very much.